Let's go ahead and begin our discussion of uh, the concepts and processes that are associated from a homework one perspective. Uh, what we're going to take a look at uh, here in this uh, first homework assignment is a lot of terminology and concepts involved relative to uh, things that are involved in the realm of statistics. So uh, this will be one of the very few chapters or homework assignments that's going to involve a lot of terminology. The rest of them will involve calculations that we will be utilizing Microsoft Excel inside of the course to help us uh, do the respective calculations for the course. So one of the first things that we're presented with is data. And as a business analyst, as a person that works in any profession out there, be it business, nursing, uh, computer science, information technology, regardless of the field that you're going to be getting into, data is something that is very important when working in the realm of statistics and trying to make inferences or decisions from data. Data is nothing more than an observation. If I came in and started collecting data uh, from the class, I would identify everyone's gender as either being a man or a woman inside of the respective class. So data is nothing more than the collection of given observations that takes a specific value. That's all that data is in, in a nutshell there. Now, the uh, analyzing or putting together items and making conclusions about the data is the study of statistics and truly is the reason why you are taking this respective course. It's not the, just the fact of, okay, we need to get you a math credit inside of your bachelor's degree or associate's degree or whatever you're you're doing uh, as far as your uh, college career, but truly speaking, statistics is the analyzing of data. When you're hired on as an analyst and are working with a particular group, you're responsible to tell a team lead, an executive team, what is going to be the result of that collection of data and to make the proper inference on it. If you can't make the proper inference, that could have a substantial impact in terms of what uh, your corresponding business, your your team, whoever the case may be in terms of what you need to do in terms of making your business or your uh, organization successful. So that's why we study statistics uh, from a holistic perspective. Now, when we deal with collection of data, it falls into two categories, the first of which is the population, and the next one is going to be called a statistic. Population is the whole enchilada. For example, a population would be all students inside of Park University. So it would be the 10,000 plus students across the United States as well as the world that are enrolled in Park University. Now the subset of that population is what we're gonna cover here in the next few minutes. But population is all measurements that relate to a group or entity. Now a census collected from every person or member inside of a population. Back in 2010, you were required by federal law to complete a census, which was all 300 plus million people inside of the United States had to complete the census. From that census, we make decisions off of that particular data. Most uh, notably, uh, if you notice from Missouri's standpoint, the amount of representatives that are allocated of the 435 are reallocated based upon the given census that's taken every 10 years. Some states may lose a representative, some may gain. And you can look at that every 10 years as far as the flow of different things, also relative to the census, how things are allocated as far as federal funding. So that census helps makes decisions in terms of the United States population. Now, we're not the federal government and truly, we don't have means if we're a business entity of some type to basically survey 300 million plus people. 
So the underlying question becomes is what's the next best thing when it comes to collection of data? And that's where a sample comes into play. A sample is no more than a subset of the members selected out of the population. For example, back when I was talking about Park University students, a subset of the population may be all students at Park University that are taking MA120 or the statistics course. Notice everyone inside of the class is taking, uh, is a Park University student, but specifically I've narrowed it down to a subcollection or a subgroup that consists of students that are taking the MA120 course. So that's where sample comes into play. For example, it says the Gallup Corporation collected data from 1,013 students in the United States. Results show that 66% of the respondents worried about identity theft. The population consisted and one time was 241 million. I'm assuming now that's well over 300 million, but the population of that came from the 241 million uh, and they surveyed or took a sample based upon U.S. population individuals. So that 1,013 came from the 241 million uh, individuals in the United States. As it makes mention, the sample consists of the 1,013 polled. The objective was that the sample data is a basis for making a conclusion about the population. Again, we do not, in most business entities, have the means to collect data from all 241 million. So what we try to do, and especially from a timing perspective as well as a financial perspective, is to go in and take data from the 1,013 that are pulled and not just go in and take the whole enchilada or the whole 241 million in this case. So the sample, we try to, and we're gonna identify later on in the course quantitatively in terms of identifying, does the sample reflect the basis of the given population that's out there? One additional component that we need to make sure that we keep in mind is when we collect data, is that data precise? Is it accurate? And do we want to, or we want to ensure rather that there is no biasness that's introduced inside of that data. I may go around to all of you tonight and go in and ask the question, do you like the St. Louis Cardinals? By the way, if, I, if you say yes to that question, odds are you're probably going to get some bonus points this evening. Now, if you come back and you say you like the St. Louis Cardinals, I've introduced a biasness because I told you initially when I asked that question that I was going to give you bonus points if you like the St. Louis Cardinals. And by the way, I'm going to subtract points if you like the Kansas City Royals. So uh, I was born and raised in the St. Louis area. I'm a diehard Cardinals fan, and Game 6 of the 85 World Series is the greatest statistical anomaly that's out there. But that'll be later discussion inside of our course. However, I don't want to introduce biasness in terms of collecting data. And my example, when I told you I was going to give you bonus points, if you said that you like the St. Louis Cardinals, doesn't give an accurate representation of collecting data that's out there. So... When we analyze and make our conclusions out of data, I don't want to introduce biasness inside of the data because that would give us a skewed result in terms of how I analyze or make inferences from the given data. So from a contextual perspective, what does the data mean and what's the purpose of the study? Does the data support what I'm trying to conclude inside the scope of my study? That is very important when collecting data is what's your final goal and does the data support it? For example, if I was to ask, you know, it go around and collect your gender being male or female inside of the class. If I was to collect and let's say there's eight women and one man inside of the course, I could make the inference that there are more women than men inside of this class tonight. However, from that data that I just collected, I can't come in and say all women inside of this class will earn an A because I don't have the data to back it up. And from that study, 
I got to have the data support what I'm trying to conclude in that inference. If I don't have the data to back it up, that study is irrelevant. It is a fallacy in terms of when you're collecting that respective data. As we talked about, is it objective? My study of collecting, if you like, the St. Louis Cardinals or not, would introduce a biasness. So I need to be vigilant, uh, vigilant, excuse me, in terms of making sure that when I collect the data, that it not it wouldn't introduce a biasness. I would have probably been better asking the question, what is your favorite Major League Baseball team? In that instance, I didn't introduce you better say St. Louis Cardinals or else, or uh, when I come in that I don't have a St. Louis Cardinals shirt on, you know, I'm basically come in, ask you the question, I get the response. And I need to make sure that response is very close-ended. In other words, I'm not going to ask you the question, what is today, uh, how do you feel today? That's an open-ended question. And I can't get a quantitative response back from that. So, again, i got to be vigilant in terms of the question that I ask and ensuring that I get the data in terms of it being in a closed format. Sampling method is very important. We're going to take a look at different ways to sample data here in this presentation. Does the method chosen greatly influence the validity of the conclusion? Again, my example, St. Louis Cardinals-wise, I skewed your results because, hey, if I say St. Louis Cardinals, even if I don't agree with it, I'm going to get some bonus points. No, that's not the case. Voluntary responses often have biases associated with it because in that particular case, there's more uh, likelihood that special interests are going to participate. For example, self-selected, if I was the statistician and I went in to say uh, a location and I see three of my friends that like St. Louis Cardinals, I'm going to get a skewed result as a result of those particular people that I like to hang around with that I'm friends with. I need to make sure that when I collect the data that I'm randomly selecting those particular individuals in terms of representing how that population behaves. Um, potential pitfalls that mislead conclusions. Uh, one thing here, as an example, two variables that uh, seem like smoking and pulse rate. While smoking may uh, have an effect on pulse rate, one doesn't cause the other. There's individuals that may smoke that uh, have a low pulse rate, there may be individuals that smoke that have a higher pulse rate. Correlation does not imply causality. One may not cause the other. While you may collect data and show that a person who smokes versus doesn't smoke may have a higher one, it does not mean that one causes the other. It may be correlated with each other, but it, one may not actually cause the other. Let's take a look at the next one. I don't know why I didn't have this full screen before, but we're okay. Conclusion should not be based on samples that are far, far too small. Well, you look at three students, for example. One gets an in-school suspension, means zero days out of class. One gets a five-day suspension, and the next one gets suspended for the whole entire year, so say 180 days. Well, if I try to average a zero, a five, and 180, odds are you're going to end up having a number that doesn't represent the behavior of the population. In that instance, if I only survey three students, that's really not going to cut the mustard in terms of reflecting the behavior of your corresponding population. So the sample of three students is really not going to be accurate in terms of identifying the behavior of that corresponding data. Loaded questions. Uh, my example of the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, again, was a loaded question because I wanted you to answer a certain way, so I kind of did, uh, you know, are you sure you really like the St. Louis Cardinals? Because if you do, I'm going to give you five bonus points as a result. Again, can be misleading. You know, 97% yes, should the president have the line item veto to eliminate waste? Should the president have the line item veto or not? So the first one, 
kind of, you know, led you in a certain way, it was loaded. Versus the other one, should the president have a line item veto? Yes or no? Notice in that case, you may have gotten an entirely different response based upon the wording or the schematics of that given question. Some other ones, questions are unintentionally loaded by such factors, the orders of the terms. We just illustrated. Another one, would you say traffic contributes more or less to air pollution than industry? When they're reversed, you may get a whole entire different item. So again, the wording of the question may yield two entirely different results. Non-response. While I don't like to fill out surveys, and it seems like every time that I travel, I get a survey from Hilton or Marriott or wherever I stay at, and they generally, I hit the delete key as far as the email, but truly, if you want an accurate survey that's out there, you really need to ensure that you get an answer to everyone that's out there. Now, you can't force somebody or hold a gun to somebody's head and force them, you better answer, I'm going to pull the trigger type thing. No, that's not what I mean, but in terms of trying to eliminate the no answer or I don't care type of response. You want to make sure that if the question is yes or no, that you get a yes or no, or you get a finite number of answers when uh, those particular items. Example, people who refuse to talk to pollsters have a view of the world around them that's marked differently than those who would let pollsters into their homes. So again, you know, Obviously, in my particular standpoint, I don't want to fill out the survey or answer the question because who I voted for back in 2016 is none of anybody's business. And it wasn't Trump, but uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, again, it's it's none of anybody's business in terms of you know my my vote is my right as an American citizen, and I don't really feel that it's anybody's business. But again, I didn't vote for Trump. But uh, again, potential pitfalls in terms of non-response can come into play. Uh, missing data can dramatically affect results. I'm a pharmaceutical company and for example, I'm trying to come up with the newest drug for uh, solving uh, male pattern baldness, for example. And I leave out individuals that are in their 40s, for example. That could potentially skew the results in terms of the data that's collected. So again, you you really need to represent uh, your sample to behave like truly the population comes into play. Another example that's on the screen here, people with low incomes are less likely to report their income. So again, I may not get data from individuals that are homeless or low income. I need to ensure that I get that particular data into my sample to reflect the behavior of the entire population. Precise numbers. If you go and you're gonna apply for a job here in the next few weeks, and one thing that's typically asked for on a job application is how much you made on your last job. I guarantee on that application, you did not write down $57,234.12 that you made back in 2016. Odds are you probably would have listed that as either 57000 or 58000 The precision on a job application really doesn't give you that much bang for the buck in terms of identifying the accuracy of the given data. Typically, people reply when the annual salary to the nearest thousand versus listing it to the nearest cent. Now, if you're reporting your income to the IRS, yeah, they want that to the exact penny. Though when they refund or figure out how much you owe at the given end of the tax year, they round it to the nearest dollar because they don't want the pennies as part of the calculation. If you look at your corresponding W-2s that you get at the end of the year to report your taxes, yeah, those guys, the precision is to the penny. However, when it comes time to the uh, corresponding uh, reporting back, everything is expressed in terms of dollars. You'll notice even on a Missouri, a Kansas return, uh, as well as your federal return, everything's expressed as whole dollars. And that's actually been that way for many, many years. So the precision 
may not uh, it may not be the case where you need to the exact cent you're talking about money. Uh, percentages misleading or unclear percentages are sometimes used. Continental Airlines ran an ad claiming we've already improved 100 percent in the last six months. Yeah, right. You know, especially with a lot of the airlines right now, uh, you know, at least uh, causing physical harm with others. I, I, not buying that 100%, it sounds a little fishy, to say the least. Does it mean that Continental made no mistake? That's the inference. When I read that information that's presented to me, oh, yeah, we've improved 100%. Now, that kind of is a little bit misleading in the words that it's there. Yeah, we, we may have improved 100% relative to the mistakes that we've made before in terms of lost baggage, but that 100%, when John Q. Public reads that, gets a whole entire different perception of what happened. Well, we've improved 100%. Yeah, and pigs fly too. So again, the, the perception uh, when I read that statement is entirely different than what the number truly implies. Okay, parameter, population, sample, statistic. When you are dealing with the statistic, it comes from a sample. Notice both of the words start with the letter S. That is the way that you keep them straight. When you quantify a statistic, it comes from a sample. Compared to a population, comes from a parameter. Those guys start with the letter P. Now, when we quantify data, and from our particular MA120 course, everything we're going to do inside of this class is based upon quantitative data. All the mathematics, all the calculations are going to be based upon quantitative analysis. There are, if you take an MBA course, there may be a qualitative reasoning course that you will potentially take. But in this MA120 course, that is why it is mathematic-based, because we use numerical data and do calculations off of that data inside of this respective course. Qualitative versus quantitative data, the first part we're going to take a look at is quantitative or numerical. You put a quantity or a number in the quantitative side. So the weights of supermodels, the age of respondents. You put a numerical value to it, hence making it quantitative. Categorical, you don't put a number to it. You're not going to put color of hair, for example. You're not going to say one blonde, two brunette, three bald, you know, and your instructor being bald. You know, you're not going to put that into the mix and put a number to it. It's going to fall into a categorical or qualitative type of response. The gender, male, female, and professional athletes. Shirt numbers on professional athletes' uniforms. Now, a lot of times I get this back, especially, let's say, Kansas City Chiefs. Well, you know, 0 through 20, 20 is typically quarterbacks and kickers. So does it have a quantitative number associated with it? Well, no, because as a counterexample, many wide receivers, for example, typically – have 80s as their numbers or 80 through 88 as their numerical digits. However, there are some uh, that Keyshawn Johnson years ago used to wear 19 as the number. Uh, there used to be other wide receivers that used to be within that 0 to 20 group that typically was reserved for quarterbacks as well as uh, kickers or place kickers inside of a team. So those two-digit or one-digit numbers – that are on the back of the Chiefs' uh, jerseys is still in the categorical side. So keep that in mind. It's not that when you see numeric digits, does it always mean that it falls into a quantitative standpoint. Now, when working with quantitative, it falls into two different umbrellas, either discrete or continuous. The main deal with discrete is can you count it? The number of cars you own. You own no cars, one car, two cars, three cars. The number of children you have. No children, one child, two children, three children. You do not have 2.5 children because if you have 0.5 of a child, uh, we probably need to contact the authorities. That's probably not a right thing. 
Continuous has no gaps. You cannot count all of the possible values. Your annual salary, well, either you didn't make anything last year and it starts at zero to potentially an infinite number. You cannot count all salaries that a person can make because the smallest value is zero. Obviously, you don't make negative amount of money, so it starts at zero, but how many numbers exist from zero to infinity? Well, an infinite amount. That's gonna fall into a continuous type. Discrete, as we made mention, countable. The number of that eggs a hen laid. At the end of let's try that again. The number of eggs that a hen lays. They don't lay one and a half eggs. So either they didn't lay any eggs, one egg, two egg, three eggs, and so on. Now, that's countable. That's the measure of discrete. That's the key that is associated from a discrete data perspective. Continuous, infinite amount of numbers without gaps. Well, milk can be anything, let's say, two gallons to three gallons. Well, how many numbers are there between two and three? Again, infinite. There are no gaps in the measure. In this case, the amount of milk that a cow produces, again, could fall between two and three gallons. But how many numbers exist between two and three? There are an infinite amount of numbers that exist. That's why this one would be a continuous. And you are gonna see inside of the first homework assignment that I'm gonna demonstrate different examples where you're gonna to have to identify if something is discrete versus continuous. Another way to classify data is by levels of measurement. We'll take a look at those different types here. Okay, nominal level of measurement cannot be arranged in an ordering scheme. You can't put any order to it. A survey response, yes, no, or undecided. If you put one to yes, two to no, or three to undecided, there really isn't a numerical value that you can put to it. Hair color would also be a nominal level. You wouldn't put one to brunette, two to blonde, three to bald. It doesn't allow you to analyze or to do quantitative measures on it. So nominal is typically values that you cannot put uh, to a corresponding numerical or quantitative type of uh, response. Ordinal, yeah, you can use letters with it, but it has a specific order. An A is higher than a B, B is higher than C, C is higher than D, D higher than F if you're talking about course grade. So that is an example of ordinal. Interval involves data that can be arranged but does not have a natural zero part. So in other words, if you're looking at something from a chronological perspective, you can talk about BC before Christ or AD after Christ, 1000, 2000, 1776, 1492. If you're doing a historical perspective, there are things that happened BC and there's things that happened AD. So interval, two data values. However, there is no natural zero that's involved. Ratio has a zero starting point. So the cost of your textbook, you uh, purchased my math lab at roughly $105. So it can start at zero or can increase without bounds in that case. But the major difference with ratio it has a zero starting point. Another concept that's going to be addressed inside of homework one is what is called a random sample versus a simple random sample. We're gonna address the difference between those two here uh, within the concept or the context of homework one's assignment. And I will show some examples when we work through homework one, what the difference between the two is. Uh, so uh, when we collect data, we wanna ensure that we know if something's a random sample versus a simple random sample. So uh, we'll address that here later on in the presentation. And let me make this bigger again. Statistical methods are driven by the data we collect. We typically address things from one of two perspectives, either an observational study or an experiment. Let's look at the difference between the two. Observational study, observing and measuring specific characteristics without attempting to modify. I go and give you a final exam inside of this course. I wanna study the behavior of how you learn the material 
over the course of the eight weeks inside of this MA120 class. That is an observational study because I present you with the final, you complete the problems, I then collect the data, i.e. your score, based upon your performance. Now, that's an observational study. An experiment, I modify the behavior. For example, on that same final exam, I go in and I give you half of the answers to say the 20 problems that are on that final exam. So I've already given you 10 of the 20 questions answers. In terms of your behavior on that final exam, odds are if you already got 50% of the answers, you're gonna study for that final exam differently than compared to if you had to study for all of the 20 questions in that case. So again, I affect the behavior on that given collection of data, that is an experiment. And we'll see other examples inside uh, the presentation as well as inside of homework one, where you're gonna be asked to determine if something is an observational study versus an experiment. The Pew Research study surveyed 2,252 adults and found that 59% of them go online wirelessly. This is an observational study, because all we did is we asked the 2,200 roughly uh, individuals if they go online wirelessly. There was no change in the behavior. I just asked the question, do you go online wirelessly? i.e. is, is it a, your smart device, your PC, do you have wireless access? I asked the question yes or no. That's an observational study. I didn't go in and say, hey, here's a coupon to AT&T, Sprint, Verizon for, you know, 10, uh, 10 gigs of free service. Well, that would change the behavior in that particular instance. It would not be an observational study in that case. Now, in the largest public health experiment ever conducted, 200,745 children were given the SOC vaccine, while another 201,000 were given the placebo. For the first 200,000, was given the drug. The other 200,000 roughly were given a placebo. For half of the individuals roughly, we changed the behavior. That's an experiment. Typically, Quintiles does that. If you go for a study at Quintiles uh, in uh, Oberlin Park, typically you got half of them that get the placebo and half of them that actually get the drug. And they wanna see if there's false positives as a result. They don't tell initially who gets the placebo versus the drug because they don't want to introduce a false positive of, okay, I think I have the drug I've been told. I may act to that differently knowing that ahead of time. So the experiment is in play for this example. Now, a simple random sample is a sample of N subjects and selected in such a way that every possible item is, has an equally likely chance of being selected. We'll see examples of this inside of our homework one when we get to it here in this presentation. A random sample, members from the population are selected in such a way each individual member in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So a simple random sample is more restrictive in terms of the group that's selected. Again, we will see that here later on in the presentation. Systematic, you choose every eighth item out of the given population. For example, back in 2016, I went into the place where I vote uh, at my voting location, and there was a person from the Gallup poll that was standing there asking the question, who am I voting for for president of the United States? Odds are you would have known my response. I say I choose not to answer. But I did ask the gal that was there, what was her sampling method that she used? She told me that she selected every seventh person that was in line. Notice by selecting every seventh person, that is considered to be a systematic sample because she selected the seventh person in line, the 14th person, the 21st, the 28th, the 35th, and so on. She didn't go up and say, oh, that guy looks really scary. I'm not going to ask him or her. I went up to a group of three friends and then got the three observations. As long as she was consistent of every eighth item, if she selected 
every 10th person, every 8th person, every 5th person, as long as that was consistent from the time she started to the time she ended collecting that data, she did a systematic sample. Convenience sampling, one of the worst ways to sample your data. You're screaming outside of your, uh, your ledge of your building and, hey, do you believe in the death penalty? Obviously, that's probably not going to happen too often in real world perspective. However, as an example, my mother-in-law used to work for Tyson Foods and she was a quality control personnel at the plant out in outside of Sedalia, Missouri. Well, there was a guy that she was working with at the particular time that uh, was part of her QC group that uh, she was employed with that basically would, uh, through a pallet of, you know, those wings that you get at Costco or Sam's Club in big 20-pound bags. Well, what the guy would do coming off the line when they started at 7 o'clock in the morning would only look at the first pallet and basically take his results from that first pallet. Well, that line runs for a good eight hours in a given day. You're not going to get an accurate sampling uh, based upon only looking at one pallet. What if the temperature changed in terms of those frozen items coming off the line? What if the weight wasn't 20 pounds that was supposed to be in there? You don't know what's going to happen later on in the day coming off of that given line. So what that man was doing was a convenient sample. He did his work the first 30 minutes of the day and basically did nothing else the other seven and a half hours. Obviously that person was later terminated as a result of his lack of sampling the correct way from a QC or quality control perspective. Stratified, you break into a group of strata or strata. Maybe I want to group and ask questions from a female or woman perspective or a man perspective. Obviously, I'm not going to ask questions about the newest shampoo or conditioner uh, that involves uh, hair color treatments. My wife gets her hair colors or the different things that are associated from that perspective. I'm not going to go and ask questions to the male strata. I'm probably going to concentrate uh, focusing my efforts on a woman's perspective because men, for the majority of them, are not going to have their hair colored. There may be certain men that uh, that is important to them, and that's perfectly fine to each their own. In my case, I'll never have to worry about that. But again, I may want to concentrate on asking women in that particular group. So I've created a strata in that particular instance to only address from a woman's perspective. Cluster sampling is another way. I may, within different municipalities, there's the 8th District, 16th District, fifth district may go in a particular strata and ask questions in that particular case. So in other words, I divide into sections, then randomly select from those sections. So uh, if I break up into the 32 municipalities that are in this particular city, then randomly say, okay, I'm going to choose five, then 16, then 28, then you are doing what's called a cluster sample in that instance. There are other types cross-sectional that are out there, retrospective, data is collected based upon the past, which is another type that's out there, prospective, you're collecting from future, retro, you know, back in the 80s, you're retro, you know, back in the 80s or the 90s, so you're collecting data from the past, perspective, you're going into the future, so that's a major difference between those given studies. Okay, now it's time to go ahead and take a look at a representative sample of the types of problems that you're going to see inside of your first homework assignment. First problem that's listed here, it says determine whether the source data given below has the potential to create a bias in a statistical study. First one says Wash U or Washington University obtained word counts for the most popular novels over the past five years. They collected books. They counted the amount of words that are in there. There's nothing there that says, oh, they only selected uh, fiction or nonfiction or a certain type of book. So all they did was they went and collected novels in that instance. They did not change the behavior 
So there does not appear to be a potential bias inside the data. So letter C is going to be your best answer. There does not appear to be a potential to create a bias. The organization would not gain from putting a spin on the results. All they're doing is obtaining from novels a corresponding word count. So they didn't go in and select their favorite author and then basically look at that particular scenario. So that completes problem number one. Number two, given the table below, what issue can be addressed by conducting a statistical analysis? We have to be careful, and this is what we talked about earlier, that you have to address what the data is being provided. You can't read into the data more than what's listed. Let's take a look at the wrong answers and see why those are a fallacy or incorrect on it. Letter A says the data can be used to address whether the issue of whether males or feel, females feel more comfortable about their pulse rates. Feelings don't come into the mix of things. You know, my opinion on, you know, what how the data looks is irrelevant. I collected the data. All I can make is inferences on the given data. How I feel about something is left to Dr. Phil. That's his specialty. In terms of what the data is collected, we're like dragnet, only the facts, ma'am type of thing. So how I feel about it was not included in this given data. You can't read more into it than what's being presented. So letters A is not correct. Letter C, the data can be used to address whether there is a noticeable biasness in the study. I don't know that. All I got is the data based upon gender, as well as five observations for male, five observations for females. I don't know if there was biasness in the study. I don't know if they drank 12 cups of coffee before they had their heart rate or their pulse rate taken. I don't know that. So again, C can't be made as an inference as a result of the data that's being presented. Letter D says the data can be used to address uh, the issue of whether treating patients with blood pressure meds can lower their pulse rate. I don't know that. I don't know if that was in this study or not. So relative to that, all I can work with is what data was given to us. Letter B says the data can be used to address whether male or females have pulse rate with the same average mean. I can add up the five males, divide by five, that can give me an average. I can answer that question based upon the given data. I can do the same thing with females. Add up the data, add up the five observations, divide by five, that can give me the average of those five individuals. So again, I can answer the question based upon the data that was given for letter B. So B being the correct answer there. That completes problem number two. Question number three, several studies show that after accessing the internet for schoolwork, subjects have an increase in grades. A broadband internet provider financed the research. Eh, 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 danger, Will Robinson. What is wrong with this study? It's a self-interest. This business has something to gain as a result of this. So broadband provider, the Time Warners, the Comcast, or whatever Time Warners called now, they're called Spectrum, I think. Uh, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, the, the Sprints of the world, finance the research. They're trying to gain based upon the data is being collected. That is a self-interest in the case. And what triggered that is the wording of, a broadband internet provider financed the research. If it was a third party that was collecting the data, I would say in that particular instance, we would have been fine because the Sprints, the Verizons, the Time Warners, the Comcast of the world, I keep saying Time Warner, it's Spectrum now, um, have something to gain as a result. Well, if, you're, if you purchase uh, Comcast high-speed internet uh, access, we will, your students will increase their grades. Now that, again, that's, this is self-interest in this particular instance. Answering letter A as the correct answer to problem number three. Number four, causation versus correlation. We talked about that earlier inside the presentation. It says, based on a study of weights of men and women who are vegetarian, a researcher concludes that eating vegetables can cause people to lose weight. Yeah, one may cause the uh, or other, or excuse me, one may have a correlation with each other, but one may not necessarily cause the other. Some people may eat vegetables that have very high carbs in it, 
and may actually increase their weight in that instance. So while one may be correlated with each other, it may not exactly cause it. So if I look at the four options, letter A is gonna be our best answer because there may be a relationship or a correlation between vegetarian diet and weight loss, but one does not mean one causes the other. Again, this is an example where we were dealing with uh, the difference between something being correlated, having a relationship versus one, one instance or inference causing the other. So letter A is our correct answer, completing problem number four. Let's take a look at problem number five. It says a polling company reported 27% of 2,286 surveyed adults said they played baseball. What is the exact value of 27% of 2,286? Well, 27% as a decimal, you move the units two places to the right. As a decimal, that is 0.27. And you'll notice on my calculator here listed on the screen, I'm getting ready to calculate this. So I got 0.27. I'm gonna multiply that by the 2,286 given to me. And you'll notice as the correct answer, 617.22. Listing is the correct answer to part A. Now, can you have 0.22 of an adult? Again, if you've got 0.22 of an adult sitting at your residence, we need to contact the authorities. That's not accurate in that instance. Even though that calculation yielded a decimal value, it's not the way that you would want to report that given data back. So you list, notice on part B, it says, could this result from part A actually be the number of adults? Well, again, it, it's common sense that you don't have 0.22 of an individual. So letter D, no, the result cannot be an actual number because the count must represent a whole number or the converse, uh, there's mental issues if you're representing 0.22 of a uh, individual. So we cannot represent that with a decimal. What we need to do now is take a look at, do I report back 617 or do I go up to 618? What I wanna do is I wanna round that value to the nearest whole number. If I look at the two in that number, the underlying rule is zero to four, you go down, five to nine, you go up. If I look at that first two there, I'm going to go down, which will lead me with 617 in that instance to the correct answer to part C. Now, for the other piece of this, part D, it says, among the 2,286 respondents, 1,553 said they'd only play hockey. Well, how do I get that percentage? Again, if I pull up my calculator, I'm going to take the 1,553 out of the total sample space of 2286, that's gonna get me the decimal of 0.679, et cetera. To convert a decimal to a percentage, I take that result and multiply it by 100. Notice now I have 67.935. I'm gonna take a look at that five. Again, same rule, zero to four you go down, five to nine you go up, so that five is gonna cause me to round that three up to four. And notice as the correct answer, it's listed as 67.94%, completing problem number five. Let's go to six, a report about the decline of the Western investment in third world countries concludes, after years of daily flights, several European airlines halted passenger service. Foreign investment fell 350% during the 1990s. Can you have more than 100% failure? Can you get more than 100% of yourself? While it sounds good, that quantity does not make a hill of beans of sense. You cannot give more than 100% of something. In the realm of uh, when we quantify something, we typically do not go over 100% to represent it. So in this case, if foreign investment fell by 100%, then totally eliminate. So it's not more, it's not possible to eliminate 100%. It isn't like I'm going to kill you and then I'm going to kill you again. It, it just, again, doesn't make a hill of beans of sense. You're not going to kill the investment and then go and do it again above 100%. Again, you can only give 100% of yourself. It doesn't make sense to do more than that. So that's why letter B 
is listed as the correct answer to problem number six. Let's look at seven. A researcher once criticized for falsifying data. Among his data were figured uh, obtained from eight groups of subjects with 25 individuals uh, in each group. Well, again, 100% is our basis, just like what we talked about in the previous one. How many groups can I have with 25 individual subjects? Well, if I take 100 divided by 25, that means you're going to have multiples of four. So when I look at this, I can only have something that is four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, et cetera, up to 96, 100%. So it's got to be divisible by four in this case. When I look at the correct answers, I got to have the one that is in groups of four. So if I look at this, all percentages should be multiples of four. And again, I took 100 divided by the 25 to accomplish that. These can't be correct because all of these would have had to have been divisible by four. 53 divided by four is going to give you a decimal value. That can't be correct. Same deal with 58%. 58 divided by four is not going to have zero as its remainder. So again, I took 100 divided by 25 to identify the four, which confirms that these values are a fallacy, that they are not accurate. Completes number seven. Number eight, in a study of 3,688 professors at a college, it's found that 40% own a television. Okay, all professors were studied at a college. Population parameter, remember they start with P. P population parameter, S for sample and statistics. So all professors were studied at a college, we're dealing with a population. Population and parameter are synonymous. If it said out of a study at a college they sampled somebody, sample would have been statistic. But since everybody at the college was surveyed, that is population, which is a parameter. Parameter becomes the values of numerical measurement describing a characteristic of a population. Completing number eight. Let's take a look at problem number nine. Number nine says determine whether the value given below is discrete or continuous. Again, if it's the case where you can't count all values, it's continuous. If it's countable, it's discrete. Volume of a cola in a can is 10.5 ounces. Well, can you count all possible values that are in a volume of a can of Coke or Pepsi? The answer to that question is no. It's continuous. Continuous, you cannot count all of the observations. Completing number nine. Number 10, same deal. Uh, determine whether it's discrete or continuous. Number of days of rainfall in a year is 15. You can count the number of days in the year. No days of rainfall, one day, two day, three day, all the way up to 365 or 366 if it's a leap year. Since it's countable, it's discrete as it's correct answer to problem number 10. Number 11 is asking the difference between an observational study or an experiment. Research is conducted to determine if there is a relationship between colon cancer and fat consumption. Well, there's nothing there that we have a placebo group uh, and a group that was given a specific drug. It's just they observed what was happening. There was no change in the behavior. Hence, observational study is selected as the correct answer to problem number 11. Number 12, again, addresses observational study and an experiment. In a study sponsored by a company, 14,359 people were asked what contributes most to their happiness and 66% of the respondents said it was their job. Well, again, no, we didn't hold a $10 bill in front of the employees and ask them that to answer as far as a job perspective. There was no change in the behavior of this. Again, it is a given observational study. So notice letter C, study is an observational study because there was no treatment. You did not change the behavior of this particular study. So problem number 12, letter C is its correct answer. Number 13 addresses the different types of sampling that's out there. The key to this particular one, when I read this, a researcher selects every 
807 social security number and surveys the corresponding person. Every kth person, in other words, 807, and that 807 sounds like a pretty odd number there, but as long as they selected every 807th person, this is systematic. And we talked about this earlier in the presentation. And systematic sampling is the correct answer to problem number 13. 14 is going to address the difference between a random sample and a simple random sample. A worker assembles one item every 15 minutes, so 160 items are completed in the first week of work. Her manager checks the work by randomly selecting a day of the week, then reviewing all the items she completed that day. Does the sampling plan result in a random sample and or a simple random sample? Is it a random sample? Yes, because choosing from all 160 items, equal chance of being selected. Is it a simple random sample? The problem with it being a simple random sample is this particular manager selected a given day of the week, be it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All possible groups did not have an equal chance of being selected because if you select Monday, for example, Tuesday through Friday, if those are the working days of the week, did not have an equal chance of being selected. Hence, letter D is selected as the correct answer to the second part of problem number 14. And last but not least, number 15, identify if it's cross-sectional, retrospective, or prospective. If it's retrospective, past, prospective, future. A researcher plans to obtain data by examining the financial transaction of victims who perished in a tsunami. Well, that tsunami would have had to have occurred in the past, so if it's in the past, it is retrospective. Answer the correct answer to problem 15. This completes the demonstration for homework one.